to generate conversation. This resource was core to the co-design activity, which was incorporated into our workshop following the move to digital presentation. Prior to remote work, the third activity for the workshop was an analog simulation networking game, but this was no longer a possibility moving to Zoom. This change was made to encourage as many genuine moments of connection between the participants as possible. Through playtesting of the what would you do activity, we found breaking our participants into groups and providing each one with a different modifier to the presented scenarios increased the amount of discussion that could be had for each portion. By changing the relationships and specifics of each scenario, it made our participants reevaluate their initial thought processes and dive deeply into analysis of how they might approach each situation. Through running the whole workshop remotely multiple times, we discovered a number of solutions to ease its facilitation process. These takeaways include decreasing the number of participants to drive up discussion, increasing the number of facilitators to smooth transitions, preparing, the, uh, preparing with the participants several days in advance, and running internal communications through secondary channels. And now Sitang will uh, cover how our art and UI work to create an inclusive atmosphere. Uh, thanks, Jack. So for activities one and two, we have a different UI to bring different experience to our audience. For activity one, pieces of me, we have a simple and clean feeling for the overall UI. And for activity two, what would you do? We have a watercolor and occupational style to match with the scenario content of the interactive. A strong iteration we made was to improve gameplay by changing the font to be more readable for participants. For activity one, pieces of me, we have a different characters for each prompt. To make the characters more inclusive, they don't have too many identifying features such as the facial features, body shape differences, or other identifying aspects. They all wear the same white t-shirts, so they are equally ambiguous. Each character displays a different pose to portray the meaning of each prompt. To give user feedback and the visual interest to character poses change when the mouse hover over them. For activity two, what would you do? We made 3D characters with an unlit shader to erase light and shadow influence. This helps to match with the 2D background where we have the multiple characters total, and we added a skin tone variation of the initial play test call for more diversity. For our 3D character animations to increase the workflow efficiency, we made different animation pieces for each character. These animation pieces can be combined and shared to create different scenarios. Through different body language combinations, we are able to convey different emotions. For the environment of the game, we use 2D backgrounds of four different venues for the scenarios. These backgrounds are a watercolor style and uh, Locations are informal mixers and conferences. And uh, here is the final result of combining of the 3D characters with 2D environments. There's no shadow and light to portray a more artistic feel. Uh, and now Kwan will share how technology supports the workshop. Thank you, Stone. So for the tech part, we have completed the doc tech documentation, which would help to hand off this project. And there are various sections in it. One of them is our tech test, designed to ensure participants can communicate effectively over Zoom and make sure our applications work on their device for effective discussion. Having these instructions will help the facilitator get the most out of the tech test. Another significant section explains how the photon networking in Activity 2 works and how to change its settings so the networking functions like creating rooms, set, sending messages could be applied easily. How to edit the project content for both applications is another important part of the documentation. Included in that is how to change our art asset. And uh, it's very simple and straightforward as long as they have the basic understanding of Unity. Talking through a few of our tech solutions designed to support collaboration within the workshop. 
For example, in activity two, what would you do? The participants will, will comment and vote for multiple times. So in order to protect the sensitive content and keep the activity anonymous, our content would only be shown on the facilitator's screen and shared by the app. Another one is in activity one, piece of me. Since the participants need to post and share their screenshots on Google Slides, we made a button built in the app to do the job for them, while they can still choose where to save the image. This function helped to streamline the process and improve the experience on different devices. And Jim will talk more about our tech card. Okay, thanks, Quan. So uh, the most frequently asked question in our playtest is, uh, why did we structure the tech that way we did? So the first activity pieces of me is composed by a desktop app with some shared Google slides. And what we do do is made by a networking app and let participants discuss using Zoom with or without breakout rooms. And co-design part is currently finished by Google slides and breakout rooms in Zoom. So we look at the needs of the activities first, then we build based on the pros and cons of the tech platforms and iterate it on them. And for code design especially, we really let the discussion elements were the most important part, and those actually can be achieved through Zoom and Google Slides, which are the technologies that we already got. So uh, we received a couple of final feedback after running the workshop with our target audience, including time, shared motivation among participants, and break room arrangement. And we regard time as the most primary challenge. So participants feel rushed with the hour and a half that we allotted for them, and if more time was allotted for this workshop, participants may feel more at ease and they will have more time to think through their thoughts. Okay, so what could we do to improve this? So we can have a more experienced facilitator running the workshop, or we can get an additional facilitator who is in charge of sharing their screen and keeping the workshop on time. So as mentioned previously, we are delivering this workshop to the NYU Game Center to be running for 2020. And George McCandle is a student who works with Dr. Koniger, and they will use this workshop and other couple of activities to run as class throughout the allyship. And we will pass all the working files, assets, and documentation to their team on proper platforms by this week. And here are some future iterations on our list. The first one is we want to form a community for participants who have gone through the workshop to connect with like-minded individuals who have come before them. And this could be a side channel, a Facebook group, or other social media groups. And we also think of developing additional activities that vibe well with this topic, including a series of following workshops as in what you plan. It would definitely help further the discussion. And an online web client opens up the possibility that the facilitators only need to share one link and the participants don't need to download anything as opposed to the two applications we let the participants to download right now. And for activity two particularly, we want to have a screen that the moderators and any participants that are confused can follow along with. Aside from the facilitator screen, it would be very useful as well. And when a group leader disconnects, either we use a hotkey or a system automatically makes another member the leader. It's also important to accommodate for technical issues. And we want to thank everyone that helped us put together this workshop to promote allyship in networking. And this workshop can be implemented by anyone with the means to run it. And with the activities, as well as the documentation, will be in a shared document location by tomorrow. And we'd like to thank all of those who offered to help this semester, and especially those participants helping us run this workshop and giving us so many awesome feedback. So we are teaming Power Up. We are running a workshop to help encourage students to be better allies to each other in networking situations, and we are now open for questions. Yep. All right, good job team, yay. So good job. I think Dave will now moderate uh, Q&A in the chat, call on people. Carl, you want to go, go ahead? Sure. Um, hey, you guys, really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, wondering, and I, I don't think I missed it in the presentation, but did you actually run some of the uh, events? And if so, what were the results? Um, how did the students feel afterwards? Did they feel better prepared? Uh, and, and how would you measure that? Thanks. Um, we got to do one actual test with our uh, target audience. We did other tests with uh, students and faculty. And the target audience, uh, we thought it was really successful. They had a lot of great discussion moments. So that's the main way that we're measuring it is just like, did they come to the solutions themselves? And did they talk about it like and have full group participation? And we think they did, um, but we definitely asked in the survey what they thought. 
Great, thanks. And I'll just ask a follow-up question. Um, what were the sources of the scenarios that you guys created for them? It was actually really difficult uh, to find sources. We asked um, various ETC speakers, like when people came to give presentations, uh, we asked um, uh, Erica from PBS. We asked a bunch of people. Um, luckily, a lot of people didn't have negative experiences. So I ended up drawing on like personal workshop experiences and I asked a lot of friends and family. Um, we even started asking like outside the game space, like so because these issues tend to happen to marginalized people uh, in different spaces. And uh, oh, our partner uh, Mitu, she had some suggestions as well. This was close to her, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Shirley, you wanna go ahead? Hi, um, I wanted to see if you had a chance to test with any of the potential facilitators and let them take a look at your guidebook and see if they understood and thought they would be able to run a session. Um, so the guidebook isn't fleshed out enough, like it wasn't soon enough for them to look through it, but yeah, they got to go through the experience with the target audience students and um, yeah, they, they had like a lot of awesome ideas about how they would change it and we gave them ideas and they felt like it was a really good um, start. They're going to take it and uh, kind of form a class around it in the fall um, and they'll incorporate it into their class. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Jesse, go ahead. Yeah, if um, if you guys were going to have this be as disseminated as widely as possible and uh, and cause the most influence what do you think would be you know uh, what do you think would be the ways that it could it could do that uh, so I would say uh, if we if they form a group uh, that first point uh, so that people have, who have gone through it can help others. I think that's a really big starting point. And then as long as the documentation is understandable, uh, people can go in and change the scenarios. So they can change the scenarios and they can adapt it to whatever their audience is. So we're hoping that anyone that has facilitator experience could go in and run this. Like uh, for like Grace Hopper, um, like various universities that teach game design, uh, we think it could be a pretty wide audience. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. That's time, team. Good job. Congratulations. Yay. Virtual presenting. All right. So if you all can uh, get ready to mute yourself and turn off your videos, and we can have a uh, liftoff unmute themselves and turn on their videos. There they are. Whenever you all are ready. Hi. And I'm not sure my screen right now with sound. Awesome. So, is everyone ready? Yeah. Yeah. About Rongjia? Yep. Cool. So, and don't mute yourself either. Speak. So, we can get started, I guess. Uh, hello, everyone. We are Team Lift Off. This is the team. And our instructors are Shirley and John. Our client is the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, who are also in the Zoom with us today. We will be hosting a healthcare conference called Lift Off PGH 2020 this December. It was originally planned for September, but got postponed due to COVID-19. It is a two-day conference that aims to bring together people from technology, healthcare, education, and entrepreneurship to reimagine the future of healthcare in Pittsburgh. The attendees of the conference is a very diverse group of people like investors, educators, policymakers, students, everyone is invited. The age, experience, and levels of attendees varies a lot. We're expecting about a thousand attendees and the conference will have about 60 booths in the exploration area. And the goal for our project is to create a web app for the conference to help attendees better enjoy the conference with booth recommendations and to get the feedback for the conference in a creative way. One thing I want to point out is that our web app is to facilitate the conference experience and not to distract the attendees from the conference itself. 
and a metric of the success are client requirements, technology, and user experience. This project started last semester, and a team of two people worked with Jessica Hammer and they love user research and initial design. We, the ETC team, lived off. We designed the web app, developed and deployed it with a lot of iteration and process. And after the semester, there will be another team working on this project, and they will be testing the app and add features if they want. I want to mention that our client hired two of our teammates to join the team after us. So Ashley and Rongjia, they will continue working on this project during the summer. So uh, our deliverables for this project will be first for the attendees, we have a deployed web app that can make recommendations and collect feedbacks. Second, for our client, we have uh, created a tool for them to add booth information and get user data. Third, we have a very detailed set of design and tech documentation. We'll talk about them in more details later. Next, Shirley will talk about where we were at HAFS. Thank you, Chang. Okay, where we were at HAPS, we were still at the RPIS. So as you can see here, these are the features we completed by HAPS. QR code generator, five survey questions, boost recommendation, and self-report boost visits. I will mainly introduce the new features we added after HAPS. The first feature that we added is the tutorial page. Since we saw lots of confusion through playtesting, we provided an instruction to the users when they first use the app. Remember that the users need to take a survey to get recommendations. We added two more survey questions that the users can either take or skip. All survey questions are provided by our client. At HAPS, we recommended three boosts to users and they were not dynamic. We now recommend five boosts and allow users to refresh recommendation after five boost visits. So this is the interactive map. We have one main map and five submaps. The interactive map here is for users to track both status of visits, like visited, unvisited, and recommended. Another app that attendees all have, which is called Eventbrite, has a traditional map that users can use. After users report their visit to a booth, they will get a chance to share their thoughts. Here you can see some of the dialogues after users submit their feedback. We're done with the pictures. It's time for a quick demo to give you the overview of the actual app. I'm gonna start to um, share my screen right now. I just can connect her iPhone and do a live demo here. Okay. And scan the QR code here to enter our app. Most attendees at the conference will scan the QR code to directly log in because they will have the QR code on their name tags. Or if they do not want to scan the QR code, they can scan the, uh, they can sign up with their email addresses. And let's go to the main page. We first need to take a survey to get the recommendations. So I'm doing the survey question right now. And you can see I can skip these questions. Uh, to save some time, I'm gonna skip it right for now. And if you there do, um, take these two questions, they will get more refined recommendation. All right, so these are the five um, recommended booths we have. Let's click one of them and mark visited. This is one of the feedback questions that the users will get. Uh, users can choose what shoots them the best or typing any comments if they want. And, and then you can see the visit booth will become at the bottom of the list and uh, if they do um, mark all, all of them visited, they can have a chance to refresh the recommendation. I will show the interactive map here. So I can go to any booth to, uh, in this map. Let's say if I want to go to the payment and regulation, click here. And I can see num booth number 19 and uh, number 22 and number 27 are recommend recommended to me. So let's go to the booth number 22. Here we go. So that's it for the demo. I'm gonna end my uh, screen sharing right now and go back to the slides. All right, so now you have a better understanding of the web app. Besides what you just saw in the demo, we had other updates and changes in tech as well. You are very welcome to give it a try later. Now you have the link here. Next, Ashley will talk about the web app, uh, web app iterations and the design process. Thanks, Shirley. 
So I will talk about how things in the web app evolve from the half tier now. Here are the screenshots from the first design to the current design. We separate initial design into modules and suit the design into the scene. So after halves, we have internal playtest, which included three faculties to test the version that we showed in the halves. They all find it has the nice color and clean UI, and it's easy to go through. But they also mentioned that they get confused sometimes for lack of indication to show whether their action is being processed. They also thought that directly jumping the tutorial is not attractive and emojis should be more clear in the feedback system. So based on these feedbacks, we made some changes. We not only added the loading animation for transition, but also created three types, 20 customized transit nodes to indicate the user's status and personalize the experience. And we also added the cute launching animation to attract our audience at the first sight. Emojis we use are Unicode for easy understand. Then in the play test day, we got nine play test testers in total. They mentioned that the feedback system is now very clear and easy use. They point out some details that we should keep working on, such as they get confused about the interactive map because of we have the duplicate big data and the black button is invisible on the white background. And it's not obvious when the booth is visited and they want to refresh the recommendations to see more. So later, we add more simple booths into the map and make it more similar towards the actual floor plan. We also adjust the back button for the users. When the user screw down the page, the head of this booth will pop up and the back button will always be seen on the top left. To make the visit booth more obvious and easier for users to use, we change this visit booth to the bottom list and marked it with grayed out picture and added the stamps on it. Then we also had a soft and client play test. We, we are so glad that we got 11 faculties and three client members to join. It's so good to hear that they feel like this web app is straightforward and engaging. But to make this web app a better product, they mentioned that we need to adjust the language inside the app to be more directional and informational and consider to adapt more forms resolutions. So finally, our final web app looked like this and we addressed all the feedbacks we received and we also had a full full page included. Next, Rongjiang will talk about our next two deliveries, tools and documentation. Thank you, Ashley. As we mentioned before, there will be another team after us continuing working on this project before the conference in December. So we realized that we need to be prepared for the future. Like our team has some alternative designs and ideas, the team after us may want to develop new features and do more playtesting. And before the conference, there will be finalized data. And after that, our client will want to collect useful feedback and information. Therefore, we have developed very detailed tools and documentations. During SOFTS, we got a lot of feedback from faculties, and then we did some playtesting and iterations. Now we have a tool with a lot of features. First, it can help our clients import data to the database. Second, some faculty mentioned during SOFTS that we should add more warning messages when they are doing delete actions, and we should talk about data final collection and representation with our client. Therefore, we add features that allow our client to export user useful data as Excel files and safely clear database. And for backend programmers, Firebase has, has its own console that can be used to edit every aspect of the project. We also got feedback from Softs that suggests us to send the tools to our client and to see if they are helpful and easy to use. Here is a testimonial. Hi, I'm Megan Butler, and I'm an innovation associate with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. I've been working with the Liftoff team at ETC this semester to build a web app for our upcoming healthcare innovation conference, Liftoff PGH 2020. And here is a demonstration of me using the tools page that the team developed for us so that after they pass off this project, we can continue to upload data like new users and new images for the different booths. 
So here's a demonstration of me manually typing in a user's email address to download a QR code like this. I'm also going to test the method of adding user information by uploading an Excel file. Then we also have the option of uploading booth information manually. If we wanted to add an image, this is where we would use the Firebase. And I should also point out that the team also very helpfully created a tool manual. So if I ever forget how to do any of this, I can just go back to this tool manual. We're definitely going to use this tools page moving forward as the team hands off the app development. And we are looking forward to doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank As you. we promised in Soft, we have developed very detailed documentations for anyone that is Hi, I'm Megan. that is potentially related to the project. In the design aspect, we have documentations that address all the design elements that we have now, such as core elements, UX flow, UI mockups, and design guide, and alternative designs like post event report and like we want to put a big screen in the exploration area that shows some data representation. These are options that the next team can choose to implement. For example, we have two ideas for the big screen design and both of them are explained in detail in the design documentation. As for the tech side, we have included instructions and information for developers, programmers, or anyone who want to know how the project is working. For example, we have instructions for those who want to run our app on their local devices. Our instructors recommended us to do a play testing before we hand off the documentations to our client. So we got good feedback that says our documentations, documentations are detailed and formal and easy to understand. We also received some constructive feedback. And based on that, we made some fixes and improvements, such as fixing typos, adding more screenshots and flowchart. And some faculties mentioned that we better have an in index to tell them why and when they should read the documentation. We add that tool too. Uh, so that's it for our tools and documentations. Yeah, and that's pretty much about our project. It was a great learning experience, and we want to share two of the most important lessons that we learned. First, it is very important to communicate very clearly what each person's responsibility is. We only have four people, but we have very clear role for everyone. Producer, designer, front-end programmer, and back-end programmer. So every time an issue comes up, we know exactly who is responsible, and we created a Trello board to check them. Second, prioritizing is necessary and important. We have a lot of great ideas in the Boost experience, but we only have one semester, so we constantly communicate with our client to make sure that we're doing uh, the work that has the most value to them and to the attendees. And uh, there's much more. If you are interested, feel free to check out my website. And um, yeah, we want to thank the following people for helping us during the semester. Our teammates are very awesome and responsible. Our client is very helpful and supportive. And thank you for coming into the Zoom with us today. And our faculty instructors are uh, always full of good advice. And uh, so to recap, we are team LiftOff. Our goal is to build a web app for the conference LiftOff PGH 2020. And at the end of the semester, we delivered the web app that we promised. Other than that, we made a tool for our client to add booth information and get user data and a tech and design documentation with some extra alternative ideas for the next team to choose. And now we're open for questions. All right, great job team. Yay, Thank good you. job doing a virtual presentation. So now Dave will help moderate Q&A in the chat room for you all. Well, you got a question? Yeah, I was really impressed with the, the visual quality, the over, overall quality of the product. Can you talk a little bit more about the graphic design? Uh, was the client working with a third party design company uh, that already had collateral? Did you create all the collateral that we see behind you as well? Or how did you arrive at the look of the app? So the question is about our, the look uh, about our app. And Ashley, do you want to take this? Uh, yes. So before that, um, we actually have a website that client asked the third party to do it. So this app is uh, facilitated uh, about the conference. So all the elements in our app are built by ourselves, but it should also support uh, or suit for that uh, theme. 
So we did a lot of, um, we tried to do some research on their like in integral uh, guide and try to make our ideas suit for that theme and uh, make this conference consistent and smooth. Yeah, and you can see in our background, we have uh, some mockups about their conference. And this, this design elements and Ashley's background has some little icons on it. These elements are designed by our clients is before our project. And we need to match the style of our art assets as close as we can to the whole conference design. And, and I think uh, Ashley did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? I've got a quick question. Uh, you alluded to it a little bit in the presentation about the, the big screen design, I think. Could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about um, where some of the design thinking was around the whole conference experience beyond just the single attendee experience with that stuff? Cool. So the question is about the big screen idea. And uh, the big screen idea is uh, extra that our team created. Uh, other than whether we want to, we have some other ideas to make the conference more awesome. So we come up with this big screen idea. So we want to put a big screen in the conference in the booth area. So other people, when they send a feedback, some uh, the big screen will have a picture and some pixel of the picture will light up. Light up. So it's like a collective uh, collaboration uh, process. So if you send a feedback, uh, some parts of the big screen will respond. And if most people send more feedback, uh, they will, our idea is to have a little rocket on the big screen. And if we collect some like uh, 500, I just don't remember, 500 feedbacks, the rocket will lift off some, something like that. So to inspire people to use our web app. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, team, that's time. Good job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, lift off if you can like uh, mute yourself and turn off your videos and Blacklight Studios is up. So if they're ready to get themselves unmuted and videoed on. Absolutely. Let me share my screen real quick. Yeah, start whenever you're ready. All right, so hello everyone. We are Blacklight Studios, the game pre-production team for this semester. I'm Brandon, the producer on the team. Our faculty instructors are Chris Klug and Ricardo Washington. And here is our team. So we created a tactical role-playing game with a unique plague mechanic. Uh, you play as a disciple of the Dark One, trying to defeat the High Priest to secure his role on Earth. Our target demographic is young adult gamers who have experience with the genre. So before we get more into what we have created, I want to address the issue with the subject matter of our game. Um, most likely, our game would have been either delayed or outright canceled due to the subject matter with the state of the world that we are currently in. Um, if we had the foresight to predict everything that would happen this semester, uh, we absolutely would have chosen a different game and mechanic entirely. Um, once the world went into the state of quarantine due to the virus and we received feedback about misgivings people had about our game, um, we sat down amongst ourselves and our advisors to discuss next steps. We ultimately decided to finish the game we initially set out to create due to time constraint. Um, we were already so late into a semester that we could not afford to pivot our setting and mechanic as we'd already spent most of our time designing around the plague. Um, creating the environment and characters that are inspired by real world religion and built mechanics into our gameplay demo that showcase these elements. Uh, simply put, we would not have been able to fully create our pre-production package if we would have pivoted. Uh, with that being said, here's what we are delivering as part of our pre-production package. A gameplay demo of how our gameplay loop and play mechanic feels that serves as a groundwork for the experience the next team will build. An art package that showcases all environments and characters that will be featured in the experience that we anticipate will be built alongside lighting and material exploration. Um, code documentation that serves as a guideline for future programmers to easily understand our code base and to allow them to quickly build on. And design documentation that describes all design decisions we made from mechanics to UX and UI. Um, our three most important metrics that we focused on during this project were documentation, prototyping, and gameplay slash interactivity. Now I'll go a bit into how we chose our story and setting for our experience. We were given the 14th century France, specifically the Black Plague pandemic, by our advisors as a starting point for us to work in, as it is a rich period historically that rarely gets covered in the video game medium. I spent the first couple of weeks researching historical events, important figures, and clashing factions at the time for inspiration for our game. 
Eventually, we came to the decision of dialing it back to a good versus evil story, or the player plays the evil side simply due to scope concerns. Um, we chose to play the evil side because controlling the plague makes more sense if you're evil, and players like to play the bad guy in games often, as it gives them a role that is vastly different from the real world lives. Uh, since our game is a tactics game and is only an iceberg of what a full experience would be, the focus is on the climax level. We wanted players to spend almost all their time engaged with the gameplay. We wanted to choose a story that could be delivered with a few lines of dialogue, as we wanted to focus primarily on tactical gameplay over dialogue and cutscenes during this semester. I will now hand it over to Andrew to talk more about our design process. Uh, thanks, Brandon. I'm Andrew, one of our team's game designers. Our design process consisted of research, designing mechanics, and playtesting, both internal and external. Our weekly sprints were formatted where playtesting looped back into identifying the problem or brainstorming. Most of the research we did happened before halves, but we performed more research on UX UI design to learn more about how to make our prototype more user friendly. The two biggest problems we dealt with was game balancing to avoid the dominant strategy of hit and run, or in our case, infect and run, and having a rigid UI that withheld information and limited exploration. We gave our plague doctor unit additional abilities beyond simply being able to infect others with the plague to increase engagement and help move away from the dominant strategy, those abilities being plague harvest and corpse explosion. We ran internal play tests to try out our ideas for units and their abilities, and after the transition to remote work, we used tabletop simulator to continue our internal play testing. Every unit created and all of the important gameplay systems have design documents that detail our vision for the future of the game. After design documents were proofread, we created test case documents to provide a list of conditions that when met, proves that the system is working properly. These can be rechecked after something new is implemented or something has been changed to find possible bugs. Now Yang will talk about playtesting. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Yang, the other game designer on the team. Playtesting also plays an important part in our design process. It provides us with essential immediate feedback on our design and allows us to pivot our design at the earliest possible time. Now I'll we'll go through all our playtests and show you how we iterate our design based on our playtests. We did our first and second round of playtests with our paper prototype, and the purpose of a playtest was to get a rough idea if the core game mechanics were found to players, and if the plague mechanics were central to the experience, if the new mechanics were valid. We did the playtest by building a tutorial level in our paper prototype and observe players' tactics and experience, and ask them a few questions on site after their playing experience. As the summary of the initial playtests, 10 players tested the game ATC at Han Library. We found out that players enjoyed the game, but some of them thought the game could be more challenging and found they were adopting a dominant strategy during the experience. Hence, we made some decisions, including we removed non plague related units, and we updated the AI rules to make the game more challenging. We built a more open ended map so that the previous dominant strategy wouldn't be as effective. After halves, the digital version was ready and we moved on to playtesting with the digital prototype. The or original plan was, was, was to have the paper prototype playtest running at the same time to test our new mechanics and size. But due to current circumstances, we have to rely heavily on our digital one and do our playtesting online. And in our third round of playtest, we want to test if the user interface will have for, for players, if the play mechanics were intuitive, and if is there still a dominant strategy and how do players enjoy the game. We gather feedback by a follow-up survey online after the player's playing experience. 15 players tested the game in all, and the majority who did not finish the game found the game not as enjoying, so the user interface was the main issue. But on the other hand, with new units and terrains introduced into the game, the issue of the dominant strategy was solved, as you can see from the graph in the bottom right corner. Various tactics were adopted during player's experience. Hence, we decided to work on UX UI design based on the specific feedback we gathered from the playtest. Later, with some UX UI design problems solved, we started our fourth round playtest trying to validate some assumptions to test if the UI was uh, to test if the UI was more helpful for players. To know better answers to our questions, we embedded the data collection into the game and answered less and biggest questions in the survey. Six players tested our game online. One of the assumptions we had is that uh, we wanted to test if the data we collected, including the playing time and the units killed in the game, were relevant to how players enjoy the game. However, it turns out they have little connections. But on the other hand, we found out that by explaining our questions better, the R square value for the regression between the answer was almost doubled, which could be useful for conducting a more effective and accurate playtest in the future. And the results still show that there were rooms for more UI improvements. Hence, we decided we'll remain focused on UX UI design for the remainder of the semester, including camera movement, camera movement, camera snapping, 
also where and when should the interface be presented to the players. And as for the results of our design, we have the index document for reference for the next semester team to have a better idea of the structure of our design and can easily locate where these data documents are. And speaking of, of these documents, we have them in the archive with iteration notes included. The design documents covers all aspects of the game, including UX UI design, best combat rules, unique classes, AI, and the level design. And last but not least, we have detailed playhead summaries in the archive of future teams reference. Now I hand it to Edmund to talk more about character art. Thank you, Yang. So hi, I'm Edmund. I'm one of the artists in the team. And uh, we're, we're talking about characters here. And because we have already set for a, 13, a 14th century France as a background, uh, we'll be looking, we will look for references on how people will be dressing and equipping uh, back then. So we use those references, pull inspirations from, from them and start making sketches of designs. We eventually pick whatever design what uh, we think fits and we like. We give it color, see how it may look in the final render. And uh, once the design is set, we move on to a model sheet, uh, which is on the right side here, you can see. Uh, it's a plague doctor. We made the model sheet for the next team to build models. And also we document other design, design details for them to look at and reference this doctor. And the next slide is the uh, high priest using the same procedure. You can see the uh, sketches and colors mock up here. And the next one is the switch guard. You can see the reference here, same procedure. Next one is the archer, which is based on the switch guard, but wearing leather instead of plate armor. And uh, this, the gargoyle, it's still the same procedure. You can see the sketches and colors and a model sheet. And uh, this is uh, one of the minions of the dark one and also the player. Next one, this one would be the ranged version of that minion. And that's about characters. Let's have Min talk about environments. Okay, uh, thanks, Edmund. Hi, I'm Min. I'm the environment artist on the team. So for environment art, we started from research. We collected hundreds of references to create our mood board. And then we explored the world setting using these dirty and quick sketches. And after we decided to focus on the cathedral hall environment, we uh, did more detailed sketches of the decoration. We experimented with different decoration styles uh, to decide to find the best direction to head towards. And after we are settled for this basic layout and uh, decoration style, we created a gray box model and several base materials. Uh, we, uh, we did a bunch of testing in Unity. We tested our materials, lighting and camera movement. We also put our character designs into the scene to see if they stand out from the background environment. And after those testing, we focused on creating our uh, final concept art. This is the iteration process of this concept art. So you can say based on the feedback, we iterated on the composition, scale, color palette, and also the layout of furniture. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we can convey an accurate overall feeling of this environment through this concept art. We also recorded our exploration and conclusion in our 16 pages long art documentation, and we will pass this to the next team. And next, uh, I will hand it to Tyler to talk about our programming. Thank you so much, Min. So programming this semester was focused for a good chunk of time on the uh, prototypes and the quick, the rapid dis testing of design principles thought up by our designers. We wanted to very quickly be able to test our prototypes on platforms so we can see how the design principles feel actually once they're in the game in the digital format that players would be experiencing the game on. We also put a lot of time into developing our combat prototype, our gameplay prototype. So we felt it was very important to be able to hand this off to next semester's team as one of our deliverables so that they can see exactly how the gameplay would work on platform and get an idea for how that actually feels in game. 
another important part of programming this semester was the documentation. The code itself is well organized and well commented. Uh, basically, any programmer who is familiar with Unity and C Sharp should be able to sit down, look at the code, read through the comments, and be able to tell exactly what is happening where, and be able to follow the overall uh, structure of the code and be able to figure out where issues are arising when they try and scale up their own code. Uh, we also are providing a class diagram which shows the overall architecture of the code and this will be very useful for uh, next semester's team kind of figuring the more complex operations that involve communication between multiple classes. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it back off to Brandon to do a quick wrap up for you guys. Uh, thank you, Tyler. So here's what we ultimately learned as a team about pre-production. We believe that it was a mistake for us to pick a genre for a game before anything else. It severely limited our creativity for our design. We picked the plague to be our major mechanic, and we should have tried creating plague-focused experiences to find out what works best with our core idea. Instead, we set out to initially create a tactics game that focused on the plague as a unique mechanic. The issue here is that we spent almost half of our semester building up the core systems for a tactics game before we tested the plague mechanic digitally. Since we chose a tactics strategic game, we wanted to make sure we were setting up the, for uh, the next team for success, since the Exodus team last year, who built a strategy game, were not able to fully deliver the experience given to them by their pre-production team due to vast overscoping in the pre-production package. We were so focused on preventing that, um, we essentially added a, ended up starting production in the gameplay during pre-production. Um, we spent our second half of the semester focusing on iterating our gameplay demo, which is very far in development, However, this focus on building these core systems made us neglect some aspects of pre-production, such as a full white box prototype and exploration of our core idea and our gameplay. With that being said, uh, thank you to our advisors and everyone who helped us play test. We are Blacklight Studios. Thank you all for your time. And we are now open for questions. All right, great job team, yay. Presented very well, thanks. Um, and now Dave will help moderate Q&A in the chat. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is about uh, the wide and narrow views. So the wide view to see the whole hex grid and see the enemies is really good for plotting strategy and makes sense for a game player, but it would need a tight view to really appreciate the art assets you're planning for the character and the environment. Uh, Exodus spent a lot of time figuring out how to go wide and narrow and support both looks. How do you think you can set up things so the player would ever want to go into a narrow view? Um, so the question was um, about uh, camera angles and camera movement to have a wide view to look at the overall strategy and to zoom in to look at specific characters for artwork. Um, I'll hand it off to my designers who um, focus on camera movement to answer that question. Yeah, actually, we talked that about that during our halves and we done some prototypes uh, figuring out the camera movements. And during the prototype, we want to see if our camera can get a clear view of the whole, whole level, while they can zoom in and get a close view of the faces of the characters. We, we did that before half, so we have presented the videos for that. So if you are interested, uh, you can go into our archives to see the videos for all the prototypes we've made to, to achieve the close up view of showing the faces for characters and the overall views of the map, the camera. I've got a quick question. Um, I'm kind of curious about your statement about um, crossing the line between pre-production and production. I'm curious if you could talk more about um, what that line looks like and possibly what more work in the pre-production space might have been if you uh, hadn't crossed that line as much. Uh, sure, so the question was um, about the statement of crossing the line between pre-production and production. Um, so we think that our gameplay demo that we created is works very well in you know, showcasing all the elements of the core gameplay loop and whatnot. But we ended up the second half of the semester iterating on that as if we were doing full production. So we think that we should have only focused on that as, you know, a proof of concept. Like the last, I would say, four or five weeks, we focused on UX and UI. And I think that is something that maybe shouldn't have been put into the actual prototype itself, but just documented. Um, the specific line where that is crossed, it's kind of vague because um, from what we have understood for many people, pre-production means something very different to um, many different companies. Um, but we definitely think we cross the line a bit in developing our gameplay a little bit too much um, for the next team. Thanks.
Carl, go ahead. Yeah, uh, given the caveats you present, at the, sorry, <laughs> given the caveats you present at <clears throat> the beginning of your talk, what do you think next semester's team will do with the project? Um, so the question was what we believe the next team will do with the project. Um, so we think that given that we've set up all the core systems for them, they will um, fully flesh out the um, some of the ideas with the camera that we've showcased in some of the prototypes and obviously put in all the 3D artwork assets that um, they will take from our 2D environment um, character design. We also have some design documentation for um, further further iterating on the plague gameplay. Um, we're not sure if they will get to that point. So we're expecting them not to go to that. But if they do have the time, we do have that documentation there for them if they want to continue to make the plague more unique. Okay, thanks. All right, we're at time for you all. Good job, team. Good presentation. Thanks so very much. So Blacklight can mute themselves and turn off their video, and we'll have Voltex step up and give their presentation. Here they come. Oh my God, you shaved. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me share the. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Everyone can see that? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. We can start. Uh, hello, everyone. We are Voltec. Uh, this is our team and our faculty advisors, Heather and Ralph. Our dream this semester mm. was to explore the potential of cutting edge holographic displays through rapid prototyping with the Voxon VX1 platform by designing interactive experiences using a variety of techniques. We know that the volumetric technology is still in its nascent stage. So we are looking for design principles that are applicable for future. Uh, next slide. Well, in reality, logistically, we had to face a lot of setbacks in the form of the machine getting delayed, having to work with on the ability for uh, uh, early hypotheses, had a dramatic spring break. And now that we are all working remotely, it's been hard to play test. We'll also shortly discuss the technical limitations of the machine. Next, please. Uh, to give you a recap of our pitch, we wanted to focus on interactive design and come up with a usable documentation, a recommendation for future ETC use, and a polished final demo. And today in our presentation, we'll show you how we addressed all of these things. Next, please. Uh, at the start of the semester, we went through some papers, like the user interfaces for volumetric displays, and some other papers that talk about the science and the potential of such displays. But our, pro our approach here is more about the creative applications of them. Uh, next, please. To, to give you a brief overview of the technical specifications of the machine, the size of the actual display area is equivalent to the size of a, a two pound birthday cake. The resolution is 1000 by 1000 by 200 voxels, which is equivalent to pixels, but in three dimensional space. The frame rate is variable, ranging from 30 uh, to 15 FPS. And now we'll show you how the machine actually works. This is a video created by AJ. Volumetric images are created by projecting light on a screen that moves up and down at the speed of 4,000 frames per second. Through persistence of vision, the human eye blends all the light together and we can see it as a true three-dimensional object. Next, we'll talk about all the different learnings we have for this medium, starting with visual learnings by AJ. Thank you so much, Swap. Uh, right before getting into the visual learnings, I would like to start by discussing the supported visual feature set of the display itself. The VX1 supports different display modes in terms of color, ranging from full RGB all the way to monochrome, all of which have different pros and cons, with RGB showcasing highest texture and color detail, as well as highest performance cost and vice versa for monochrome. Next slide. Alongside, it also supports different rendering modes, ranging from full solid rendering to spaced out line rendering, again impacting performance from highest to lowest in that order. Here's another quick comparison. Note how line rendering is able to encapsulate finer detail, while solid rendering gives a more cohesive look to the mesh. The first most obvious observation is the inherent flicker in the device itself, caused by the display's variable refresh rate that we talked about earlier. On the left is how the flicker looks like in real life, or at least the closest we can showcase through a live stream. On the right is a process version of the same clip. The clips that we're going to showcase here in the presentation underwent processing so as to reduce the flicker. 
While setting up initial prototype scenes, we noticed that setting up lighting makes no difference whatsoever on the volumetric scene itself, as the VX1's light projection technique does not support real-time shadow casting. The only way to showcase shadows would be through baking process, but that is something that we don't recommend and we'll tell why later. In terms of textures and colors, we observe that darker colors and textures kind of hold up when the objects are of large scale, but their detail reduces as the object scale reduces as well. Black color cannot be rendered by the display at all, hence why we don't recommend baking shadows. Clutter is something important when it comes to setting up a scene for a volumetric display. It's important not to layer and clutter meshes so as to have a good balance between clarity as well as performance. Last but not least, the display does not support true occlusion whatsoever. That means that even though you can place objects in a 3D virtual space, you just cannot hide them. So after learning all about the performance cost of the various visual types, we think there's a spectrum of varying, dif varying different performances. While we don't recommend anyone to adhere to any ends of these spectrums, being somewhere in the middle by tweaking visual features to ensure clarity and performance is key. The examples that we just showcased to you were, the, were taken from the prototypes that we created. Now, Beck will discuss our insights and interaction. Thanks, AJ. So we also really wanted to explore how people would interact with the display because the inherent 360 degree nature we imagine would be very different from traditional 2D screens. We used a bunch of different interfaces in all of our prototypes, and we found that layering tech can be cool, but adding too much can add unnecessary complexity. So the first learning is that you have to have intuitive control mapping. The included 3D space maps that came with the machine was very precise, but incredibly unintuitive. Naive guests would uh, become increasingly frustrated um, being unable to learn how to move in the 3D space using a 3D mouse. The Xbox controller, on the other hand, was very intuitive, but had a directional orientation problem, where if you moved around the machine with the Xbox controller, what would be the forward on the controller might become the backwards for the avatar. We ended up fixing this by using um, the inherent compass in a mobile phone, using that as a controller so that your forward would always be the forward of the avatar. We learned a lot about how people move around the display. We found that people would do about one or two laps and then plant either by sitting or standing around the machine. Because the display is so small, people really only would move their heads or lean to get the perspective that they needed. However, we have some tips to encourage movements that we highly encourage designers look at um, to ensure that people move around the uh, display due to their design. And finally, the physicality and presence of the machine cannot be stated enough. It really truly brings that campfire social experience far different from a 2D display because everyone is sitting across it and looking at each other. It is much more accessible than AR and VR um, because it's only one piece of technology as opposed to multiple bulky head, mount head mounted displays, which hinders eye contact and really brings down that social connectivity. Uh, we found that um, it's best to really have familiarity or legacy behaviors on the machine so that when naive guests walk up to this new technology, they know exactly how they should interact with it and what they should expect. For example, playing chess on the machine uh, brings an incredible amount of familiarity to the naive guests. Um, and now Kevin will talk about design recommendations. Thanks, Beck. So now that we have all these visual and interaction learnings, uh, as we mentioned, we tested our hypotheses uh, initially and sort of from our successes and failures, here's our top line uh, design recommendations. So when choosing the narrative of your experience, you definitely have to consider the holographic fantasy that you evoke in the guest. Uh, everybody comes to it with their own sort of preconceptions of what holograms are based on their cultural uh, sort of associations with it. And also the light form aesthetic of it just really is different from uh, sort of a regular uh, high resolution image of something. So you have to sort of contextualize why that is for the guest. And you can also choose worlds that are sort of uh, more performance optimized that have less clutter and uh, don't need a solid floor like space or um, uh, underwater. Next. So with regards to the how it impacts mechanics, uh, certainly scale is a big one because uh, currently the display is very small. So your perspective is already in God mode and the camera movement can either move through a larger scene that is bigger than the actual volume of the display and you can move through that laterally or vertically or you can sort of keep the whole world within the box. You also want to consider given the scale sort of the readability and orientation of the text and UI that you consider putting to your experience and so from that uh, we'll go into the next slide and we'll talk about the orientation of the uh, no before uh, into the 360 yep 
uh, usage of the 3D space and the 360 environment. So with the game mechanics, the height itself can definitely be um, uh, sort of utilized cleverly, given that it's only eight centimeters tall, so it's hard to make it super impactful. So you can use things like obstruction and dynamic enemy motions, as you just saw in the video, uh, to sort of force uh, users to have to get regain the perspective on the display. Additionally, you can create uh, sort of intricate tangled uh, levels and level design with sort of uh, inherently 3D objects like mazes. Next, please. Uh, with aesthetics, you definitely want to consider using sort of brightly colored uh, and a sort of hypnotic undulating motions that uh, maybe also have fluid and particle effects on top for sort of indirect control and uh, potential Easter eggs. But you want to use it sparingly because it can be a little distracting for your overall experience. Um, in terms of the technology that you uh, sort of choose to pair with this display, you definitely want to consider the trade-offs for the interface. As Beck was mentioning, in terms of the precision of the interface, such as with the 3D Space Mouse, while precise, it's kind of clunky and slow. Uh, while something more intuitive, like a gesture control uh, leap motion, for example, is a lot more intuitive for the 3D dimensional uh, uh, display, but a lot, less, a lot less precise. And so uh, with the controls, you also want to consider the orientation of the player relative to the avatar. And with multiplayer experiences, uh, you want to really make sure that that's in sync. Next, please. Um, lastly, on design recommendations, uh, we wanted to talk about the magical moments you can definitely play into. And so with that, we really think that lies heavily in the physicality and the presence of this display. So, um, you know, as Beck was mentioning, the campfire experience augments this sort of multiplayer and cooperative aspect. So you can really use that both in your mechanics and also in magical sort of shared moments. Uh, you can also use layering of technologies such as, uh, such as we tried it with 360 degree camera and the VR headset. Uh, to sort of unlock other potentials, but definitely you want to consider the complexity for naive guests. And lastly, uh, playing with the blurring of the line moment is a really cool uh, concept that you can sort of evoke more wow uh, factors from your guests as well. So in testing all of this stuff, we wanted to understand uh, first uh, what kinds of feedback we could get by uh, taking uh, 2D representations on screens of a 3D volumetric content of our experiences. And so once we kind of had that documented down, which is in our documentation listed later, uh, we got the main feedback from faculty, which was, you know, seeing all of our different prototypes and trials, they wanted us to create a, a final demo that really focused on the VX1 machine itself and really lean into its um, affordances as a display. So something simple and intuitive uh, with a simple interface and inherently using the 360 nature as uh, part of the mechanic. And so with that in mind, we boiled down all of our learnings and funneled all of our uh, feedback to create our final demo called the Voltec Claw Game which is the next slide. And Byungju will go on to uh, explain a little bit more about how we created something that was inspired from our attempts to party at ETC. <laughs> First of all, we are going to show a short clip of our game to help you understand the basic flow of Voltec Claw game. Next slide, please. Stop those kids from partying in the ETC by grabbing as much as you can for the song Let's go. Let's go. do that again. After we test other extra interfaces, we realized there is a trade-off between precision and intuitiveness. We want to keep this one simple, precise, and as intuitive as possible. Even though 3D mouse was not precise and intuitive for most of other applications, we reverse engineer our experience to find the best way to map 3D mouse, which was originally included with their unit. We found X, Y, X, X, Y axis of Cloud Game match joystick style orientation of Space Mouse, and the drop button as well was perfect for the button on the 3D Space Mouse. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah. We, I'm so sorry, it's frozen. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yep, thanks. Yeah, with 360 degree nature of this platform, we utilize that as the mechanic in the cloud game itself. Because player have to look around to examine the location of price, a player will look at from the front view to find X position and look at from the side to find G position of the price. You will find that playing this game on both VX1 is much easier than playing on the flat screen of emulator. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to blur the line between, 
we wanted to blur the line between VX1 and reality and expand the space of our experience. Cloud game in reality match with the actual shape of the machine. And every time you grab the price and drop into the price box, you will see the price drop onto the side monitor of VX1. Next slide, please. Yep. Finally, in terms of the visual learning that AJ had mentioned before, uh, we tried to find ideal balance between the performance and rich visual at the same time. We apply bright color scheme and choose the shape that easy to recognize. Also, we, we apply clear visual element we made from the previous prototype, such as this wave of, uh, from Annabelle prototype in this video. And we also add some Easter egg of ETC, like ETC, uh, ETC letter and goose and goose group. So as promised, we have our ETC recommendations. Our verdict of the VX1 is that while it has a lot of technical limitations, we believe it is a great start for the medium and we're really excited to see where it goes. As for platforms, we think this would be a great BBW platform. We also think it would be a good visual story platform as long as students are confident that they can overcome the limitations and tell a great story. Uh, as for a project semester, we think an exploratory project semester would be great. Uh, for placement of the machine, there are a lot of factors that need to be considered, which is why we recommend that it goes in the demo room, the fifth floor bridge, or the lobby. Uh, in terms of the unexplored territory left to uncover, there's certainly a lot left. Uh, we barely scratched the surface, and so there's definitely more work to do with game engines, like with uh, uh, not Unity stuff, such as Unreal, and with uh, uh, Voxon's own touted sort of Voxatron engine. Uh, and also, there's a lot of work to, to be done with sort of story and cinematic experiences, as well as interactive story. And we have a whole list of future applications we'd love for future designers, especially ETCers, to check out. Uh, and we'll list that documentation link for everyone to check out later. So to summarize, we wanted to find the strengths and weaknesses of volumetric displays, and we ended up by creating 12 prototypes and iterations, a final demo in the form of the Voltic Claw game, recommendation for using this machine as a platform or demo, and documentation for each future e ec use, which can be accessed at this link. We would like to thank all the faculty that we met and all the people that helped us throughout this journey. Special shout outs to Heather, Ralph, Dave Perda, and Dave Solbaf for helping us. And thank you for listening to our presentation. We are Team Voltec. And now we are open for questions. All right, great job team, yay. Good presentation. And now Dave will help moderate Q&A. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you showed a lot of really interesting uh, design recommendations. I'm curious what you think is the most surprising to you, something that you didn't really think about when you're doing your early research in January and February, but you only discovered once you had the device here. So what, what design recommendation really surprised you? Uh, I would say that uh, in particular, uh, some of the design recommendations that uh, definitely surprised us were it, the, the way that people approached uh, the display itself. Like we expected a lot more uh, sort of desire to actually want to move around, but we found that uh, you had to sort of really encourage that in the design itself of the experience, and it had to be a uh, sort of integral part. And that's how we sort of resolve that into the claw game itself, where uh, the necessity of having to see the depth and the X, Y coordinates of that prize really require you to sort of get around the obstructions, even if it's not 100% occlusion. And so that's one of the things for me, definitely. Um, and I would say additionally, interface work, uh, you know, we started out uh, not having the display. So we decided to go hard on trying to understand what the interfaces uh, could mean for the pairing together with uh, on, in terms of the design. And so we had found that, you know, trying a variety of different, more intuitive interfaces that we thought would be uh, better for this display uh, sometimes had the trade-offs affect the overall experience so much that, you know, we just couldn't work around uh, sort of the loose control, for example, of more uh, gesture-oriented things. And also for me, like we discovered this medium is more like passive medium than compared to VR and AR. It's more like television in 360. So people will just want to see and look around and they want to see, they don't want to, they don't want to uh, act like uh, they act in VR or AR. Yeah, they use their whole body, for example. Yeah. I've got a quick question. Uh, one thing it seems like is the 
the, the development pipeline for this is a little bit complicated. I'm curious how you iterated that and how the development of the final prototype is sometimes differed than, say, the development of your first prototype. Yeah. Especially uh, remote. Sorry, sorry. Especially to do with COVID. Oh, um, so I guess the question is, uh, how did our design, like, sort of production pipeline uh, change and evolve through the semester, especially in response to the, to the recent situation? And so uh, I think, you know, we, we definitely adopted a variety of different techniques throughout. Uh, and, you know, we tried to at first just do one prototype at a time. And then then we set uh, multiple uh, prototypes due on the same deadline, but we expanded the uh, sort of um, scope of that particular sprint. And we found that having the two ideas floating between each other allowed certain ideas that didn't work for this one to sort of uh, uh, add to the other uh, prototype. And so those actually grew a little faster than, than had we just worked on them separately. And uh, definitely afterwards with regards to uh, the remote work situation, we had to pivot towards um, less, I mean, there, there were definitely less sort of uh, like live play tests because we can't. Uh, and so we had to uh, break down the ways that we would evaluate certain um, certain iterations, you know, based on, okay, today we're going to test uh, how it looks and how it, just how it looks, and then kind of see where the visuals are placed. And then the next time that we, you know, uh, play test through streaming, we'll kind of understand, okay, are the mechanics feeling good? And then we'll ask, <laughs> we'll have to do a lot of qualitative live asking of, of Byungju, who currently has the display, to sort of give us uh, as many sort of um, personal um, uh, sort of feelings towards how the claw game works as we can towards the final. Thanks. All right, team, that's time. Good job. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. So if you all can uh, get ready to mute yourselves, turn off your video, and we'll have our last presentation of the day, VR Caring.